Have we got someone in charge of the lights at all for me at all at some point? So it might be up and down at the times. Okay. That's right. There we go. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for to come down here tonight um, on behalf of the Permajet. Uh, tonight's talk. Um, it's, in, it's going to be in, in two stages. The first hour is going to be about um, calibrating the monitor and about the paper range we do. Then there's going to be a break, and then the second half is going to be about uh, paper profiling. The, the very nature of the, of the tool is designed around the phrase printing with confidence. That's one of the issues that we find uh, back at the office is people's concerns that they want to make sure that they get the optimum quality when they're printing. You've gone out, you've shot your images, you've taken all that time and trouble, and then when you get back at, to home, the ultimate task for yourselves and for, from, from Permajet's point of view is that you can print with confidence. And that when you hit the print button, that you know... Oh. Not, more, not more food. <laughs> So, the element is that, so that when you get home, that when you've taken your images and you've processed your images and done whatever editing you need, that ultimately when you hit the print button, you know that what comes out at the end is going to be satisfactory to you. And that's one of the biggest hit hurdles that people face at the moment with colour printing. So, it's not going to be in very technical detail because I'm a salesman and salesmen don't do technical, we do discounts. <laughs> but there's going to be an element, it's more about the features and benefits of colour management, why it's important, how to achieve it. Um, the range of papers, which George has said, is quite extensive and we'll go through that in a second. Why we've got so many. Uh, and then after the break, uh, an opportunity to talk about print, uh, paper profiling. Okay? <coughs> so, I haven't got these electronic papers. That's what I like to see. So, who's familiar with Perfect Jet, when I ask? Show of hands. Two, three, four, four, five, five. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect Jet's been in existence as a brand since 1999. But we were originally formed in 1983 as Nova Darkroom. So if anyone here has done Darkroom in the past, George has, we used to do, well we still do, uh, slot processors for fibre base and resin coat for black and white paper processors. That's the company that Robin Wetton, the MD, founded in 1983. In 1999, he saw the onset of digital coming and set up the brand Permajet. So we've Move from darkroom to digital, even though we're still heavily involved in the darkroom. But primarily, darkroom now is on the educational side of things, uh, as hobbyists as they tend to get through the darkroom at home and have moved into the digital arena. And the brand is UK based primarily, but also um, a lot in Europe, in Belgium, France, Germany, and the Nordic regions. And we've recently got dealerships now, or distributorships, in America and in Australia. So, we're a worldwide brand and we're expanding into the Far East as well. So, the element of the tool tonight is, is, and how common is that? Why do my print not match what my monitor is saying? A lot of time people, they import their images from the camera, they look on the screen, they go wow, and the fact of the matter is that when they print out, they're disappointed. And it's getting from that start point to the end point that we're going to go through tonight. So the intention is that at the end, that the monitor will match the printing injection. Can I ask who has issues here with colour management and getting a print to look like what it is on the monitor? Yeah. A lot more hands than people that know Bermajet. Right, okay, it is quite common. But there's nothing to worry about, it's something that we can help you with. So, one of the first questions we ask, do I really need to use colour management? Anybody here know what percentage of men have issues with colour and 
To the extent that my optician said to me, Colin, do you ever go to 3D movies and not get the benefit? I said, I do actually. He says, yeah, because you can't. I, my tolerance of red and green is so poor that when my son's are going like that, I'm going, what? And it's how I actually see colour. And back in the 90s, when I was with Ilford Imaging, for those of you who remember Ilford Black and White, yes. there was products called Cibachrome. And um, I was being trained on how to do colour processing. And, and the teacher was, uh, the lecturer was going really frustrated with me because I was seeing, I thought things were neutral, but they were warm, and it's how I see reds and greens. So I'm one of the 10%, so I've got my exclusive blood. But can you really trust your eyes? A lot of people think they can, but ultimately. So if I can just have the lights on, please. <coughs> Thank you. I'm just going to do a little test. Uh, I'm going to show you. Three papers. <coughs> Can you tell me what that colour is? White. 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 And white. And white. And white. Yes. When you compare them side by side, you can see that they have quite a colour shift. Yes. So again, when we all look up here, all look the same or similar anyway. But the idea is there's differences in whites as well, and these base tips have a fundamental effect on when you're viewing prints coming through. So when we go through the choice of papers after this bit about the monitor, it's quite critical on when you're looking at the paper base how the base actually affects the final print that you call the colour rendition that you get. It's an interesting fact that people don't take the odds on anything. But well, actually, be careful because the nature of the paper base can um, have an effect. Okay, so. I also make a point. When you make the paper, if you paint it on the black paint, you lose the highlights from the white. So I'm saying, yeah, when you, if you make a print on a piece of board, mm -hmm. and it's a similar white to your base paper, then you get a colour balance coming through that. In other words, a black paint will mess up your picture altogether or not down the highlights. It can be, and what we're going to be saying later on is that the part of that is how the eye is deceived by different, what the different light sources, which is quite fundamental on, on, on that, which is what a lot of people know. Uh, one of the last statements I'll be making is that how often people are sat at the monitor, like we could be sat here, and they're going, oh, it's not the game. It doesn't match. But the idea being is your eye is fooled by the brighter light source. Something to bear in mind. You should actually move away from one so, and look at it in a separate line. So, those three papers were yeah. all white. Mm. So, to judge in isolation is not, it's very difficult, and that's the issue why we have, tend to have issues with colour management. Has anyone seen these tests before? Yeah. Yeah, if we could have the lights up again, please. Sorry. I've never could do a good well, then, never could do a really excuse. Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you do. <laughs> okay, what colour are these two squares that's indicating there? Quick answers, please. Orange and green. Sorry? Orange and green. Orange and so this is when you've got when you have issues on your monitor of warmth deceive what you're actually seeing is a true colour. Okay. Those two squares. 
Now let's see if this works. Blue and green, are we going before? That was very laborious, and then they came up with kind of um, forms of products called colour analyzers. They did it automatically for people. And what we're going to talk about now is how that technology and that thought process has been adapted into the digital arena. And what we're going to be talking about as well, only briefly, because this is not an adaptive talk, is setting the workspace of your devices and software with record. Typically, when you buy a DSLR camera, the manufacturer defaults it to a colour space. Does anyone know what a colour space is? SRGB. SRGB, that's right. Uh, which, if you're not familiar with colour spaces, is typically three that are well known. And we're going to talk about them briefly. SRGB, which if you can imagine is that kind of a colour space. Adobe 98, which is bigger, and there's a more current one coming more into favour, but um, it's not that popular at the moment, which is Profoto. What we're saying to people is that if you're going out and you're going to use your camera, please make sure that you change your camera workspace to at least a W98. A lot of people, if you're shooting RAW and capturing it all, you've got all the information anyway. It's a huge file, but it's got everything that you need. And then you will whittle down what you need to use to process. However, if your camera shooting an sRGB, what you're needing to do is be able to process and print in a bigger colour space. So you can replicate more colours of the rainbow, so to speak, more colours. So presets, change your camera setting to Adobe 98, and in Photoshop, which is 90% you know, of what people are using, or relevance, or whatever, again, the workspace you should be setting it to is Adobe 98. If you've never changed that, I'll show you on the screen where to change it in Adobe. Because on Adobe, when you download the program, it defaults to an American setting, which is useful for the Americans, but actually it's not what we're going to be using in the UK. Well, the first stage of the process is to calibrate the monitor. Can I ask how many people do calibrate their monitor? Four, five, six. Brilliant. So you can show me how it's done then. How often do you calibrate? Every three weeks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Well, the fact you're calibrating monitor in the first place is good, because that has to be the starting point. The second point, people think, well, I've calibrated. I did a camera club, um, where was it, Monday, last week, over in uh, Bill Kingsway, and uh, the gentleman said I calibrated it five years ago. Well, things change, your monitors change, your monitors are aged, and their performance will differ. We actually recommend about every four to five weeks to just run the program, run the software if you've got the i1 device or a, a um, data from Spider, for example. A lot of clubs, I don't know whether this is one that has them, they have a central one that the club owns, and everyone's got the software loaded onto the system, and they just pass it around. So it's an effective way of doing it anyway. So finally, we'll, we'll calibrate the monitor. We're going to choose the paper that we want to print on, and then we're going to calibrate the printer using ICC profile. That's the way we're working to. Question. Does your monitor matter? <coughs> what do you think? Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. It does. And it's surprising how many people um, have invested in a high-end camera, lovely lenses, and then they have a really basic monitor from Argos or PC World. Um, but it's easy for me to say, it's not me that's having to purchase the monitor, but we feel that if you've invested in your camera and your capture technology, then what you want to do, if you're wanting to get the best out of the end, is having a high quality monitor to be able to view those images. So all modern monitors are now LED backlit. Very few are people have CRTs these days, but there may be the odd one here and there. And they are needing calibrating quite often because one of the tubes start to fade quite quickly, typically the, the blue. But there are different types of panel. And these are the three most common. If you're just buying a standard monitor from um, PC World, a Dell, no, no, I'm not having to go with Dell. Um, HP, I'm not having to go with HP. I'm not going with HP printer. <coughs> Typically, they are a TN type panel. You then move up to the IPS version or the ultimate, like the VA version. If you're investing in something like an ISO or a NEC monitor, I mean, we used to sell the eyes, though we now sell in EC. The thing about those is they are more expensive, they can be up to £2,000. You don't need to spend £2,000, but you, should, you, know, you should be spending mid range values. It's because on the top end one of these, these two, certainly, is that with NEC and ISO, each pixel of the screen in the panel has been tested for its performance to make sure that it can replicate exact colours. The lower end ones, the TMs, don't get that, that level of testing. So therefore, their colour rendition typically can be more variable. So where, what we would recommend is if you can afford it, certainly invest in a, in, a, in a monitor that has an IPS or a VA panel. Monitor workspace, even though I was talking about image capture being in Adobe 98 and printing out in Adobe 98, monitor workspace is sRGB. And to a lot of, for a lot of colours and images, that's sufficient because it gives you a very good replication of what you're going to see. But ultimately, the way to assess a print is how it actually appears on the paper. That is the ultimate, and that's the goal, is so that you can replicate your images so that when you went out, shot the image, that what you see on there, on the paper, is what you sRGB is adequate for monitors, but it's okay for you know, nicer viewing on the screen. Can I just ask you? Yes. What's the best place to have the monitor? I mean, how should it be lit? Should it be uh, should there be light coming in, or should it be in a room that's quite dark? Or the next slide. Uh -huh. Next slide. You've been looking at my slide. <laughs> no, it's, it's an important point. I think it's in the next slide that we cover that. But certainly, what just going back to the monitor <laughs> is that when your monitor's been switched on, you're looking for something of a Kelvin rating around about 5,000, 6,000, so that your monitor's performing in this kind of a range. You don't want it too warm because warm is going to affect how colours are reproduced and things like flesh tones look extremely warm. 
also you don't want it to be too cold. So you're looking for a monitor to be able to set the, the you know the Kelvin rating around about five to six hundred uh, five to six thousand Kelvin. That's the kind of colour temperature of the panel that's able to produce. Just as a gamma. It's not overly critical, but ideally that's where you want to be. When you, before you calibrate your monitor, allow it to warm up for at least 30 minutes so it, it gets to its optimum temperature. What you don't want to happen is when you're running the calibration process that the monitor is getting warmer and warmer so that colour temperature is changing because it will have an effect on the profile it's going to produce. This is the critical one. And what a lot of people don't do, when you get a monitor and you switch on the first side, it's in your face. You know, it's ideal for gaming if you want to do Halo 5 or FIFA, whatever. Wonderful. However, if the aim of you having that monitor is to be able to replicate images or to get a close to a, what we call WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get, you need to reduce the candela, which is the brightness, and typically you're looking to around about 100 candela as a guide. And I'll show you that, hopefully, it will show when I flick through onto the, the profiling software. On a Mac it's about 100 candela. What we're saying is typically you're reducing like uh, your monitor down about 70 down to reducing by 25% about 75%. You've got to drift it down because you're never going to get uh, images are never this bright. On those papers they're never going to be that bright. Because one thing because you <coughs> a monitor is beaming light through the panel at your eyes. That's how you're seeing the colour, transmission. On the paper, it's reflective. So the light, the light is bouncing off the, off the paper and coming back to you. So that it's a different type of light that you're seeing. So that's a crucial one there. Now the software that I'm running here, that it's going to be an i1 Pro, if I remember rightly. And on that, it'll tell me if it's too bright. It should do, because I've had to lift the brightness up for this. Consider the position of the monitor in the room today I was asking before, is it important? Yes, it is. If you've got the, 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 um, the monitor on a desk and the light source is behind, like a window, depending on how bright that light is, if, you've got, if you're not putting any blinds across or whatever, your eyes will always be, will always be attracted to the brighter light source. And that can cause you to view differently. It, it's your eyes going to work harder. Ultimately as well, if you have the light behind you, the window behind you, during the passage of time, depending on how long you really monitor, the, lights can, the light can change. If the light source is coming from the side, again, a similar issue, it can become brighter or darker depending on how the, how the sun is moving. So what we would recommend is, if possible, lighting, that is working in subdued light, the curtains closed if you can, to just try and minimise any external environmental changes. And again, ideally, is a hood to close your monitor. That will stop down any extraneous light coming in so that you're getting a consistent viewing of the monitor. So it is a quite important point where you <coughs> Will it go out of calibration? Yes, they will. And the older the monitor is, then the more likely it will be that one of the channels is maybe not working as effectively as it should do. So we would recommend maybe every four to six weeks to rerun software just to make sure you ban online. Once you've outlaid the cost of the, the device you use, to run the software doesn't take too long at all. And the brands that are typically out there is the Data Color Spider or the X-Ray device, which is like the i1 Pro. And the cost is around about, I googled it yesterday, I think they're around about £130 at the moment. I mean, we do sell them, but we don't sell that many because the people are cheaper than us because they don't. But someone like the Data Color Spider or the i1 Pro is typically what we would suggest. Okay? What brands do we have out here? We will calculate Spider. So, has everyone seen how to calibrate one? How the software works? No? You don't know what to say. Okay, just give you a brief example of this is for the um, iron Pro. Um, 
I'm not going to go into any detail, I'm just going to show you the basic process of it. Okay, now what's actually in on there is a typical colour space. I was talking about Adobe, yes, there's a slide coming up later on in the, in the, in the presentation about how the different colour spaces interlink with each other or overlay. That's the kind of thing we're talking about when we're talking about a colour space. The different devices will have different variations on that. At the white point and the luminance, this is where just, the white point um, is like the, the colour temperature. So typically for the UK, um, if you don't disagree with me, then please read my technical line and have a word with that. It's about 5,500. And the luminance, said before, about 100 candela. Okay. And now, next, and it should hopefully. And it's going to say start, start measurement. And it's going to put the device on now. Don't worry, your last time column, which is not set cover off. Which, now, we go to next. Now. Right. Okay. It's currently just stopped. And the reason being, I'm asking it to get to about 100, and it's currently reading the luminance at 144. So hopefully. Ooh, 93. You see how it's changed? It's dimmed it down. Okay. Now, again, <coughs> when I was doing this at home in the conservatory uh, yesterday, I mean, I was getting readings up to about 112, whatever, because it's quite bright. So again, the ambient light is playing, having an effect on the reader. So here, because it's subdued light, it's more probably going to be more accurate. So 93, I'm never going to get exactly to it, but if you, the, the, the ballpark is about 100. <coughs> right, and off it goes. So what it's doing now, it's measuring all the different shades and colours and it's saying, right, I'm reading X but it's comparing it against the library um, which is uh, like an industry standard and it's saying, well, that's what I'm reading and you need to be here and the difference between the two to bring it into line is what we call, it's called, it's what we call the profile.